My name is Ellen Dunham Jones. I'm on the faculty here. Welcome, everyone. We are thrilled that you are willing to give up a Friday night. Um, Hawks and, night. <laughs> and a Hawks night. Um, and I know, I know why. Um, we're here because Peter Eisenman is, has won the Topaz Medallion, which is an extreme um, honor that ACSA and uh, AIA to jointly give uh, once a year to one person to really honor excellence in, in teaching. And uh, I won't go into all of Bravo. the- Bravo! Yes. <laughs> so I figured, I figured the best way to, um, to try to introduce some of the students here who may or may not know as much of Peter as, as some of the rest of us do. I, I had the pleasure of working for him for a year. Uh, I figured the best way to do this was to <coughs> tell a little joke. We're, I'm going out on a limb here. Three architects walk into a bar. The first one graduated in 1963. That's the year that Peter first started teaching at Princeton. Um, so the student, this guy, he graduated before Peter had started teaching, before Peter had begun to influence uh, the world of architectural thinking. He orders a martini, hold the vermouth. Clean, <laughs> modern, minimalist marriage of form and function, no intellectual or artisanal embell embellishment. The second one graduated in 1980. She orders a Peter Eisenman. <laughs> she instructs the bartender, I want points drilled into the ice cubes, then sliced into planes, then rotated and sliced again in a plaid, so that the points become lines, the lines become planes. And, and then when the bartender says, well, and so what booze do you want to fill the volumes? She shirks her shoulders and says, program doesn't matter. <laughs> I just want the form to tell a story of its own making, alienated and independent of clients, programs, or materials. The third architect graduated in 1995. He orders a Peter Eisenman deconstructed. Forget the cubes. Start with an L-shaped lemon twist. Muddle some French linguistics. No shaking, no stirring. Turn the glass upside down, add blue, gla add blue gas, and get drunk on the otherness. <laughs> the bartender is an architecture student who hasn't graduated yet. He says, what's next? Am I supposed to be making drinks or positioning myself within the discourse? <laughs> Maybe I can digifab the next round. Do I disrupt the world of mixology through talking or through mixing? Is it about form or theory? About the idea or the thing? Hell, I need Peter Eisenman to take me out for a drink. And with that, I present Peter. Thank you. That's great. Is it on? Um, Common Rowe, my mentor, used to say you can kill a speaker with an introduction faster than you can any other way. Uh, and um, she did a good job. Um, I don't recognize any of those drinks. Uh, nor the bartender, and fortunately, she said it was 1995, so that gives me 20 years leeway. Um, <clears throat> I honestly don't recognize that. I know that all those drinks and all those people were pos possible in those days. Um, I don't think they're very possible now. Um, I'm I'm going to try. Uh, something tonight, and that is um, lecture about something that I'm interested in that I don't know anything about. Um, 
and oh, I'm going to hopefully get up here. Yeah, uh, they said I could sit down, so I'm be informal. And I appreciate you all coming out on a big basketball night. Uh, at least I would be watching basketball if I didn't have to do this. Uh, <coughs> but, but it's also a summer school, I, you know, a lot of things. So I'm, I'm at least happy that some of you came. I'll try and do my best. Um, we are working on a project uh, which is fascinating in its, uh, not its functional complexity or its site complexity, but in its iconic complexity. And it is a museum of archeology span in Istanbul, Turkey. And uh, it deals with, as you can see, the whole subject of abstraction as archaeology. And um, in talking with uh, people uh, who know something about the Quran and uh, its prohibitions, etc., uh, there's something about representation, I'm not quite sure what it is, uh, which is not supposed to be present in uh, any um, iconic form, let's say. Which got me to thinking about, well, um, you know, the Bible, the Hebrew Bible says, build unto me no graven images. And I'm wondering uh, what the relationship between that is and the project that I'm doing. And especially since uh, I made a presentation and I said uh, in Ankara to the culture ministry, uh, which is heavily Islamicist these days, um, th this project obeys the Quranic code. I was doing saying that, I don't have any idea, but we're talking a, a group of everyday people like you all, and the, you know they just happen to be on this culture committee. And so one of the people pops up and says, well, if that's the case, how come it doesn't look more Ottoman? And by that he meant representational of Ottoman, uh, Ottoman, et cetera. And I said, well, that's exactly what we were trying to avoid. The Quran doesn't want you to represent Ottoman. It wants you to be Ottoman, let's say, in whatever way that is supposed to be manifest. And then I got to thinking about um, abstraction. And um, I, I realized that abstraction became uh, a dirty word somewhere between complexity and contradiction and learning from Las Vegas. Uh, somewhere between 66 and 72, abstraction went out. And um, it's been out for a long time. And I was thinking, well, what, what, what is it? In other words, I wasn't really sure I knew what abstraction was. I started talking to people, and, um, and I look at this auditorium, and people would say, it's abstract. Uh, and then I say to myself, well, why is it abstract? It, uh, it looks very real, if realism is one aspect of, of uh, polar opposite of abstraction. It looks very figural uh, in the way the lighting is deployed. And I was realizing that we have a very strange idea, at least I had a very strange idea, of what was meant by abstraction, especially abstraction when it comes to something physically real like architecture. And I was saying, <clears throat> if you take a column, which is the easiest thing, without a capital, is that an abstract column? And my thinking is, well, perhaps it isn't. It's perhaps just another form of column. And then I was saying, if Schenkel in his Altus Museum 
uses uh, a Doric capital as opposed to a Corinthian capital, is that an abstraction? Uh, or is it just a different style? And I began to realize that abstraction, as we understood it from the modern, isn't capitals with, I mean, columns without capitals or columns without Corinthian capitals. Uh, those are mere what I would call stylisms. And so I began to try and understand what was the, the root nature of abstraction in architecture. And abstraction in the sense that um, we could uh, say that it had a kind of fundamental uh, being in architecture. And I came to this preliminary conclusion, which I'm going to deploy tonight in showing you uh, our work in Istanbul, <clears throat> that, the, that the idea of abstraction in architecture comes from a fundamental diagram of either four squares, a cruciform, or nine squares. Uh, and that there's nothing more, less, uh, let's say, fundamental than either four or nine. You can't go anything less because just to have a line doesn't give you any space necessarily, it gives you two. Uh, this gives you uh, a vertical and a horizontal and four squares. And I realized that um, there's been a Western prejudice uh, <clears throat> about the nature of that diagram to be nine as a basic uh, uh, representation, let's say, or being, uh, as opposed to four. And if we start from uh, the medieval churches, and Gothic and, and, and uh, early Renaissance, etc., you're going to find very few four-square diagrams. You're going to find nine-square because the nine uh, it allows you to have three as an entry with a central aisle, a central nave, and two side aisles. The only uh, church that I know that has a four uh, aisle entry um, is the church by Brunelleschi uh, in uh, Florence, which has a column down the center line, etc. Now, this prohibition about four squares. <clears throat> uh, stems also from the, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, and uh, you could not put a column on the center line if you were turning in a parti, let's say. And in fact, uh, Tony Garnier, the architect of the Ville Industrielle, uh, the industrial city, uh, placed a column on the center of his uh, final examination and was dismissed from the Beaux-Arts. He never got a degree. And if we look at some of Le Corbusier's work, uh, we find a play on the column in the center as a kind of thumbing your nose at the Beaux-Arts, the Maison Cook, uh, the Maison Citroën, uh, any number of early Le Corbusier buildings have the column on the center. In other words, a four square as opposed to a nine square party. And so uh, I began to think, why had there been such a prohibition on the four in, in modernism, uh, which, uh, and, and other than the Beaux-Arts, where did it come from? And I began reading, <clears throat> um, as it were, Eastern uh, aesthetics and philosophy. And I began to realize that the four uh, has a very significant place in Eastern thought uh, and that many of the Mughal gardens in, in India 
uh, and gardens from which, uh, let's say, um, Versailles were taken, all are basically four square orientations. So what I wanted to do is to start to look at, because my, my object was to say, can we bring abstraction back, uh, which I think is a fundamental need for, let's say, un reading architecture. In other words, uh, you have to be able to go from A to B to C to D and to read back to A. Uh, for me, everything else is, is representational. The reading from A to B to C to D and back is linguistic and coded. And of course, we know that mathematics and, and, and alphabets are the, the, probably the strongest uh, forms of what one would know as abstraction. You can't get anything more abstract than numbers, uh, signs, uh, et cetera. And if we could take architecture back to those numbers and signs, it might be an interesting idea. Now, the second reason, other than the particular project that I was doing, and again, all of this you have to understand is speculation in my uh, fevered brain uh, and may have nothing to do with reality. But I got the sense that there's a whole movement or feeling in people like yourselves, young to middle-aged people, um, who believe that architecture in its being represents some form of power, whether it's gendered power uh, or uh, organizational power, that architecture is a product of a power organization. And I further realized that uh, a tripartite uh, relationship of space, ABA, is a hierarchical and a sense uh, power-centric notion of space organization. That is, if we look at every city hall in the world or every public building or every fascist building, every uh, repressive regime building, there are always ABA structures. And so I said, hey, maybe I can get on the good side of gender politics. I can get on the good side of politics for once uh, because uh, one has to be interested in these kinds of issues if to stay moving in the world today. What about cutting out the B and just having the, the A together? And I began, uh, and so to me, uh, there were several reasons to start to look at uh, Foursquare uh, AA organizations. And then I gave a course last spring in, in New Haven uh, on the diptych. Now, what was interesting about the diptych is there's no Wikipedia entry for the diptych, uh, by the way. You try and find one. Uh, and that's a signal to me that it ain't part of everyday life. And uh, my students said, well, how can we do this uh, course in the diptych? We don't have a reading list. What are we supposed to do? Uh, and of course, that's what's nice about teaching a group of bright students. You send them out on a treasure hunt. Uh, you say, go find me diptychs. Uh, and we'll see what we get. Well, we came in loaded with the possibility for diptychs from uh, bipartite compositions that are vertical to horizontal to their spatial uh, front and back. And, and it was an amazing uh, revelation to me that the notion of two, that is uh, A and A prime, would produce uh, very interesting conventions. And so we started in painting with uh, a, a religious uh, theme, for example, the Annunciation. Now, there have been thousands of Annunciations that have been painted. So it's not the theme of Annunciation that's important necessarily in the painting, etc. 
especially when we get to compare a Botticelli with another one. And if we look at paintings that really have a substance of painting in them, uh, they deal with uh, the Annunciation as a diptych. In other words, the angel Gabriel is always played on his knees as opposed to Mary who is standing. The angel is outside, Mary is inside. The angel is in dark space, the Mary is in light space. So what we realize is there are whole kinds of things associated with two that, that give you a non-hierarchical, non-power-centric, let's say, in terms of organization that uh, you can trace back in the history of painting. So then I said, let's look at uh, paintings that were not set up by a religious theme, but had qualities of the diptych, that is the two, um, in, inherent in them. That is without a program that specified two. And we found quite a number of those. And then I said, let's do one with uh, a psychological theme, a Freudian or Jungian theme. Let's do uh, narcissism, okay? And let's do hero and narcissist. And what you get is an entirely different structure of two, uh, where uh, Narcissus looks into a pool of water uh, and it could be uh, Jacques Lacan's uh, 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 mirror stage where the child doesn't recognize who he or she is till he sees the image in a, a, a mirror for the first time, realizing what its wholeness is. And so you have different kinds of programmatic organizations that give you uh, what I would call a four-square understanding. And I began to uh, sort of make a typology of the relationship between the program and the form and the content to uh, the painterly organization uh, of the two. And then <clears throat> we got, and, and this is the lecture you're not going to see because this would be another lecture because uh, I want to show you my building. Uh, and see if it works, because uh, I'm basically, uh, this is background. And then we got the painter David Sally to come in, and David's basic work, if any of you know his work, deals with diptychs, and, uh, but diptychs of an abstract nature. And so we questioned him for three hours as to why he used the form of the diptych, uh, et cetera, and, and w what it meant and, and how he used it. It was a fascinating subject. So to go back, where the diptych started was in uh, the East, that is in Constantinople. The first boxes, which were diptychs, were boxes with a hinge uh, and they were imprinted in wax and carried around, and they could have been uh, mirror images, they could have been separate images, etc. So there is a, a going back to the whole idea of the two, and the and the 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 hinge. Now this brings you to another one of my own fetishes. These are all uh, speculations on the possibility of the use of these kinds of things. Um, uh, Jacques Derrida, in his uh, post-structuralist theories, uh, has a concept called the brisseur. The brisseur, I can't, my French is terrible, but I believe that's what B-R-I-S-E-U-R uh, stands for a hinge. And so the hinge is something other than the object itself, uh, it's a supplement to the object. And so what we began to find as we looked through the history of, of, of diptychs in painting, we began to see that they required a hinge figure that was outside 
of the story, outside of the, of the notion uh, of, of the program of the painting, but was necessary to the painting. And uh, right up to David Solly's present day, you can find what we would call hinges. And so uh, the hinge in French structuralist thought as a supplement, we began to realize, hey, if we can work in a, a visual medium with French structural, post-structuralist thinking uh, and produce architectural uh, conditions, uh, we might be uh, putting together something interesting. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, it may be interesting. It may not have anything to do with power or gender or anything, um, but it certainly um, gets uh, a, a, a student group, which I had of uh, 12 students this spring, as animated as I've ever had a uh, class. I'm really encouraged. And so in the fall, we're going to do a studio uh, with different students, uh, but using the idea of the diptych not in uh, two dimensions, but in three. Can we make a three-dimensional diptych? And I'm not going to go into the architecture of, the, of, of what we found because it's a, an, a whole other story. With that as a background, what I want to do is show you uh, this project as it has developed uh, in our work as a, <clears throat> um, first of all, as an urban design project. Uh, we were entered a competition uh, to do a, uh, an area uh, near uh, the Golden Horn in Istanbul called Yenek Kapı, and we were, uh, we won this competition uh, this was two and a half or three years ago. Uh, and then we were given a commission to do the uh, urban design, uh, which we did, and half our project got cut away, uh, the bottom half of the four squares, uh, because the city said, we don't care about four. But now we have truly a diptych. Uh, and now we had uh, two, as, two parts of this museum, part A and part B, which was really important to us. And they said, well, why don't we just put all of the functions in part A? And of course, it destroys the, 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 the whole idea. So what you find in, in any situation, the theoretical maintenance uh, which is required to keep architecture from just being aesthetics, representational, sustainable, uh, whatever, uh, goes away so quickly because it's not understood as an important aspect of what one does. And what my argument is, is that outside of the modernist uh, epoch and being after postmodernism now, the idea of bringing abstraction back as a diagram and perhaps bringing it back as a diptych uh, would energize uh, a world of, of proliferation of, of what I would consider really uh, architecture unhinged. Uh, and, and therefore, the hinge becomes really important because uh, and if you all don't think architecture is unhinged, you should look again at the skyline of Atlanta. Uh, uh, and you should look at the hotel, the Omni Hotel I'm staying in, and, and understand the views uh, into courtyards and what I see uh, as uh, organization. And you realize that some form of abstraction at some point is going to hit somebody, someplace. Um, not to say that this doesn't happen in New York, Berlin, etc. But I've, I've had a strong case of, of the jitters uh, um, finding my way around uh, the Omni Hotel, to wit, um, 
uh, Ellen said, I'll send a car to pick you up. Why not? Be in the motor lobby. Why not? Uh, so I was in the motor lobby. Only thing is, there are two motor lobbies. Uh, a diptych. A diptych, right? Uh, if only it were so, okay? If, if, but anyway, uh, we finally realized, because I had a cell phone, it's the first message that I've ever written into that cell. I said that I wrote south, because I'm really bad at doing that sort of thing. Um, but if I hadn't had a cell phone, we may never have uh, gotten, I may never have been here. The, th the thing is, always know when you're lost, never move. Uh, <laughs> that is because once you move and the other person's moving, you're gone. So I just knew I would just stay there and see what happened. Anyway, with that as a background, uh, David, can we take the lights down a little bit and we'll look at some images. Um, let's make sure that we understand something. While I can sit here and speculate with you all about these ideas, which is, I think, important to do, this is not a subject that I speak to the Planning Commission or the municipality about. It's not a subject that I speak to the, uh, the citizens, uh, you know, uh, Yenna Kapu, uh Citizens Committee about. Um, this has to do with uh, something other. And um, when I have to speak to people who are responsible for producing a museum, uh, we, we talk about that. Now, I mean, for example, um, the last meeting we went to, they said, well, um, how many TV sets are you going to have in your installation? And of course, we haven't even designed the facades, the, the, the exhibition rooms. We don't know if we'll have any TVs. So you get to a, a, a point of discussion uh, where, well, you've got, a, you've got a budget of X for installation, exhibition. You know, how many virtual realities are you going to have? How many animations are you going to have? How, how, many, how large are the TV screens? These are the kinds of things that eventually Clients want to know what they're getting. So uh, all of what I'm talking to you about is before we ever walk in the door of a client. Um, and um, I'm, I'm certain that uh, you all probably aware of that. If not, let me get my, I, I have two, uh, here they are, for some reason. I needed two of these. Um, diptych. <laughs> um, abstraction as archaeology. Uh, there is the, uh, this is the site. Um, this uh, road down here is the JFK Highway that comes from um, uh, the airport to the Golden Horn. Uh, this building here is the reason for the, the archaeology museum that we're doing. This is a, a, the Marmarai Railroad Station, which is the first station that connects the uh, Asian side of Istanbul uh, with, by rail uh, with the European side, so that the the Oriental Express or the Orient Express that used to come here never went through Anatolia. It would stop in uh, Istanbul on the European side. People would be ferried across and get in another train that would take them uh, east. So this this station produces uh, a million people a day. Uh, emptying out into these neighborhoods. Uh, not only what that, but what happened while they were digging here, uh, they, they dug uh, up here as well. The archaeologists found over 600 uh, boats from uh, 
the first century before Christ to the fifth and sixth century before Christ, where they hadn't even realized that there was commerce in Istanbul. And so suddenly they had a trove of artifacts and no place to put them. And uh, secondly, they had a gap here between the station and this, the, these uh, both residential and business, a mixed community here where the people were coming through here. And so what we decided we wanted to do was to make a building, first of all, it could be no higher than 30 meters. The reason for the length of the building is in fact uh, that uh, they didn't want any building to interfere with the minaret uh, skyline. Uh, second of all, they wanted a, a building that could be easily traversed. So you see all of these markings here are passageways through to the existing fabric uh, from the station so that the notion was that these million people uh, 700,000 of them would be going north which is this way uh, or uh, I shouldn't say it's that way it's actually west um, would be going west uh, would in fact uh, pass through the building in some way pass through the archaeology so the second marking factor uh, uh, was the, uh, this grid of, of elements of passageways here which connect with the existing urban fabric. And these were for future uh, digging. The archeologists only said, we can let you fill up this area here if in fact you provide us with an uh, archeological park over here. So this side of the, the building and the archaeology is for future digging. And they're convinced that if they found 600 artifacts and boats, they could find equal number over here. Uh, the, the government says we want to get the archaeologists into a place where they stay out of the way of development. And so we had to provide for all of this area over here uh, as the archaeology. So the, the second building uh, is uh, basically a research facility uh, for uh, graduate students and, and archaeologists who are actually working on, on the site. The reason for the length of the project is uh, we wanted the building to seem as an archaeology itself. And we will sh I will show you that it, the, the shape of the building is not gratuitous, but in fact takes up the old walls uh, of, of the different empires uh, as the water receded from back here uh, down to the Sea of Mamara as it exists today. So uh, basically you see what the, the, the project is. Um, and you can obviously see that uh, there is an existing rail line here and a major uh, thoroughfare here, which lends itself obviously to a four square uh, organization. So the, 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 we, we started and uh, part one uh, is the uh, abstraction Part two is the four square. Part three is the uh, urban design. Part four, uh, which you're not gonna get tonight, uh, is the, the organization, not of the urban design, but, whoop, let me, is of all of this smaller scale marking. The whole notion, it comes out of, again, a relationship of these markings to an abstraction taken from uh, Hagia Sophia, not as a representation of Hagia Sophia, not as the patterns of Hagia Sophia, but as an abstraction so that you could read back uh, at the smallest scale from windows, uh, mullions, openings, uh, solids and voids, back to the organizational diagram. 
And so there, there are two levels of, of, of at play. One is the four-square diagram as an organizational diagram uh, of the site, and the second is the abstract organization of elements from the Hagia Sophia. Uh, again, being very careful not to do anything that you would call uh, representative. So here is uh, one of the first diagrams uh, that we drew. Here uh, you can see the, the outline of the, sa the station. Uh, and uh, this is the, the community that we were given, this site, the red site line here. Uh, this is the Sea of Mamara, where their uh, ferry transit to the uh, eastern side to Anatolia. And this is the, the base, basically the JFK Highway, which comes uh, through this area uh, is the main north-south connection from uh, the International Airport uh, to uh, the downtown area. So um, again, um, this is the way we began uh, very simply. Um, and then we uh, played with the things, and again, to it will, it would take uh, more than the time that I have, w these, the angles and where they come from and how they tip and the whole notion of taking four squares and t reading uh, the different vectors, uh, the, the orientation of the streets on, on this side is, is in this direction and on the other side is here and the movement uh, up and down and, and sideways to give you what I would consider uh, an abstract diagram of the project. Uh, and the, here is the station, and that's basically our project uh, in uh, as a, an abstract idea of something that's moving toward a complexity. And the whole notion is, is that a person understanding the, the, the building, let's say, what it is, would be able to read back from here to here to here to here. Uh, that's the A, B, C, D I was talking about. To me, that is where abstraction in architecture is possible. Uh, the rest, uh, for me, are stylisms. Um, and uh, you can see uh, the, the walls, uh, each wall, uh, that's the wall of uh, Constantinople in brown, uh, the wall that uh, outlines the project site, uh, the Theodosian wall, uh, and the current coastline. So you see that there were a series of, of movements uh, into uh, the land taking over uh, the sea um, and we using these lines as markers uh, in uh, the project. Then you take um, the diagram that I showed you, uh, the D diagram, and you place it down on the site and you get, as it were, the four quadrants. Now, where the project has changed uh, is that um, this is an existing community that they wanted to keep as an integral uh, element, uh, an object as it were. So it became one of the four squares. That was, we couldn't touch that. The second square was what we know now to be a water treatment plant that was desalinating water from the Sea of Momara uh, into this particular area. And they said, we had wanted to organize that with a series of, of pedestrian ways with uh, the, the, the beds uh, for desalination. Uh, and they said, no, you can't do that as well. So we lost, as it were, the bottom half of the urban design project um, and uh, we now have these two 
uh, quadrants, which are one as a diptych with a very interesting hinge-like structure, which is not part of what goes on here, uh, nor part of what goes on here. And um, uh, we're, we're very happy, as it were, with that diagram, because uh, what we got, we got approval uh, for uh, building A, which is here, and building B, from uh, the local planning commission. Not that the municipal authority has the money to build anything but A, but we're hoping that in fact, I mean, building A without B uh, really doesn't do what we were, were hoping. So uh, we're assuming that once we finish A and the archeologists finish their digging here, uh, we'll be able to continue uh, with building B. Uh, here is what it looks like uh, when we uh, turned in our uh, competition. The competition had this uh, uh, no, uh, sort of marked area for uh, r remaining as an as old Istanbul, the water treatment area, the archaeological park, the station, and the building. Um, and uh, that's what we turned in uh, for uh, a uh, competition entry, and that's what basically the project looked like uh, when we were uh, award awarded the commission. You can see the high what it required doing. The highway, JFK Highway, is here. It goes underground all the way through to here. Uh, which was part of the original idea, so that this area could connect directly uh, to the sea. Um, but the powers that be, especially those uh, in Istanbul, were, I mean, in, in Ankara, very much wanted to keep uh, the lower half away from uh, our develop, developmental work. So, um, you get uh, the diagram, what I, what the model I just showed you. This is the, the diagram of that model. Uh, again, this is before uh, we were uh, limited to the two top squares. We were still working with a four square orientation. And then we started to look at uh, basically how we could get figuration, because uh, the, the important thing was to find a way not to have a sterile abstraction as uh, grids, but a, an abstraction that also involved uh, a form of figuration. And we began to look at things which not only were complex and produced figuration, but also uh, produced uh, possible movement. And so here's the, uh, the Taj Mughal Garden, uh, which is a very famous uh, four-square uh, organization, which has a, a center which produces figuration uh, in the uh, surrounding areas as well as in the entry areas, so that you, you never get a pure uh, four-square except over here at, at, the, at the corner points, uh, the, those four squares become pure squares. We look at Villa Rotunda of Palladio, you get, a, again, a, a figural piece uh, in a square uh, project. But again, if we look carefully at the project, there is a level that these, these outboard rooms, as opposed to here, are not square, they're uh, uh, rectangular, so that there is a preferred axis in this direction as opposed to this direction. So there are two different axial orientations, uh, and you feel that when you are uh, visiting uh, Rotunda. Uh, and then we went even further and looked at uh, Mies van der Rohe's brick country house, 
which in a sense is a, a, a dis deployment of a uh, four square uh, sen uh, sensibility uh, into uh, a landscape, uh, which is another form of a, a fragmented uh, four square organization, which comes directly out of Theo van Dosberg's The Russian Dancer. And we see here, if you look carefully here in the center, the two blue lines and the two black lines meet in a pinwheeling uh, movement, setting up a movement in uh, what would otherwise be a static organization. And you get the same movement if you look carefully here with this wall, this wall, and this wall. We have the same, uh, as it were, pinwheeling fabric of, of movement about a, in a sense, an, an unstable uh, center. Uh, and this is where we really started to get into uh, some, again, exploring uh, organizations. And one is the, uh, the Hofburg in Vienna has a very famous quadrille of eight horses that perform in four quadrants in here. And here is the diagram, uh, which I think is fascinating, of all of their uh, organizational movements. And so one cycle of, of, of visiting this is there, there is this cycle here, and then there's the outside cycle. And it depends which evening you're there, which cycle you're going to see. And for those people who are interested in uh, this sort of thing, uh, these diagrams have enormous energy, meaning, and uh, are played with, uh, often with music uh, and different kinds of music. And so the whole idea was that there are a lot of disciplines, painting, uh, architecture, uh, music, uh, which uh, develop organizations which are interesting. In fact, uh, one of my students in this uh, class this semester uh, analyzed a Bach partita as a uh, diptych and then made a diagram of this diptych of the Bach partita. And it's really wild. I wish I had slides of it, but I don't quite understand the, the sort of how he did it because I don't know music that well, but it was a very convincing idea showing how you could work uh, even through musical structures uh, producing uh, organizations uh, of two. Um, uh, I show this only because uh, a lot of people say uh, you got to work in a computer um, and I never use a computer uh, and these are my own hand drawings. Uh, which are really important to me to study uh, these kinds of things. Uh, I still believe very much in, in drawing. Uh, I still make my, my students draw uh, when they start to analyze something. I, I don't know how you can do otherwise. I was just at a presentation at Yale of a final project before an MARC I graduation and it was presented on three uh, parallel uh, screens. And the things moved from screen to screen. And I thought to myself, uh, how do you make a portfolio of this to show to an architect, number one? In other words, because the things were moving across these three screens. And of course, I asked the dumb question, uh, what's the plan like? And of course, there is no plan. And of course, there is no section. And of course, you, and then you ask, well, how does it stand up? And of course, it doesn't necessarily stand up. So, uh, and then people realize, well, we're dealing with a troglodyte. Uh, and so what I'm trying to do is from the position of a troglodyte, uh, show the possibilities that uh, might find a way to bring uh, where students really want to be these days into some sort of juxtaposition with these kinds of things. 
Um, there's a huge uh, new rage, at least in northeastern schools, uh, called object-oriented ontology. Now, I don't know if that's hit here yet, but it's on the way. Uh, and it basically suggests that people are unnecessary to think about when we're organizing space and time. Uh, and it, it completely contradicts the Hegelian notions of uh, dialectic of object, subject, et cetera. Uh, I, I don't want to go into it because that's a, a red herring in this lecture, but to make you realize that uh, seeing a drawing like this uh, is something that um, very few of our, our students um, indulge in. And to take it further, we took the four square diagram and then overlaid it with uh, as a radial diagram uh, and with a series of radiating circles so that there are any number of, of secondary readings that uh, could occur uh, within this uh, project. These were all drawn at the time of development. These are not uh, after the fact, but in fact the way we uh, developed the work itself. Uh, and uh, again, here are the archaeological park lines coming from the existing contour and main uh, lines of organization of the area itself. And uh, then you put the, all of that overlaid onto uh, the historic coastline. And of course, the red line becomes the most important to us. There are actual vestiges of the red line that uh, still exist. And so the whole contour of the rear of the project comes off of uh, the, the uh, Theodosian wall. Uh, which was a really important selling point uh, to the, the community because they said since this is an archaeological museum that the museum itself becomes a part of uh, the archaeology. Uh, and here was the model that we could see the uh, water treatment plant, the uh, sort of uh, I don't know what you would call that community, but a sort of model community, the archaeological park, building A, building B, the railroad station, and the uh, community to the west. And uh, this is a model of the project as it exists today. Uh, it's, it, you won't see it as being very different, but what's happened is this rail line here, which was the part of the four square, is we, we were cut off from any kind of development uh, south of that line. Uh, and so this is, uh, the project as it stands today, it would be very difficult for you to realize what changes were made. All of this gridding here comes out of an abstraction, uh, a very specific abstraction of a uh, corner of the pattern of organization of, of, of the Hagia Sophia. And of course, you all are very welcome to go and look and see how that works, because I, I think it's, it's really interesting and it be, produces another level of abstraction uh, from the four square into something much more figural and animated uh, as opposed to uh, a, an abstraction without what I would call uh, figuration. Uh, and this is the model as it exists, or the, just before uh, uh, the, uh, 
And this was, um, we printed this model. Uh, we couldn't have gotten this kind of detail uh, at this scale. I think it's um, one to 1,000, uh, which is what they required from us. And uh, uh, so uh, we use techniques and technologies that are very uh, important uh, to produce the kind of level of, of detail uh, in the project. This is the uh, last model that we've made. This is a 1 to 350 scale. Uh, and it's only because we're now working uh, in, in a contract for uh, building A. Uh, and would we like to be working with building B? Yes. But this um, is uh, 40,000 square meters, 400,000 square feet, 200,000 square feet of, of exhibition, which is big. Uh, I have an office of eight people. Uh, and uh, I quite like it this way because we can control. We have an office of 20 in, in Istanbul, which are our associates. And we can control with eight people and computers uh, all of the design elements that we need to with a uh, small office. And this, built, this we built ourselves out of wood because uh, we were changing things. As, and this is a study model, as it were, to understand all of the implications of these movements and cuts uh, in the uh, facade of, of the building. And of course, the important thing now is that how do we relate the inside of these walls to the inside of other walls to the inside across the way? So there's a, a sequence of A, B, C, B, A, let's say, of, of organizational uh, walls that need to have a, a, an abstract notational system that integrate front to back, side to side. And the same thing goes from the floor plan here to the roof plan here, A, B, C, D. Uh, and it's basically, we don't design anything. We just take A and say, we got to get to D. What, what, is, what are B and C? What are the possibilities of the floor plates of B and C? Uh, and um, that's what makes the work that we're doing, I think, have what I would consider to be the possibility of rethinking um, uh, abst abstraction. Uh, again, uh, a rendering of uh, the project as it exists today. Interiors, again, without any design, just basically organizing uh, the spatial relationships. Uh, then some of the artifacts that this bo these boats, you can see the kinds of things that they found the cases with uh, the artifacts. We have the lights, please, uh, David. Um, what, what is really important for me is um, not so much the building itself. Do we want to build the building? Yeah. Uh, will we build the building? Yeah. Um, but it's never been the, the physical object itself uh, that interests me. It's the possibility of suggesting a renaissance of abstraction uh, that I find fascinating. There's only one project that I've ever done where the building itself 
is important, and that's the Holocaust Memorial Project that we did in Berlin. I was just there celebrating its 10th anniversary, and I was really moved by walking through it after 10 years and saying, you know, um, this could be around for 100 years at least. And um, that's an interesting feeling. I, it's something that uh, I don't usually uh, feel or think about. That is the actual uh, embeddedness of something in the history of, of a city. The final thing I want to, the reason why abstraction is so important to me is something I learned from my mentor, Colin Rowe, on our very first trip in 1961 to Italy. We traveled uh, 90 days and 90 nights. I had never seen, uh, I'd never been on the continent. I was 29 years old. Uh, I had been to Korea for two years in the Army. Uh, and this was my first experience on the continent. And really, I was, as Roe used to say, a noble savage. Uh, at least is that in English terms. And we came upon in a small Italian town in the Veneto called Montagnana, where there is a very good prosciutto, by the way, uh, and uh, some, some of the very best prosciutto I found out later on. Uh, but there, was, there is a uh, villa, a Palladian villa there. It was a hot summer day and um, I wanted a beer. And Rose said, hey, this is your first villa. I'm going to get a beer. You stand out there and look at that facade. And until you can tell me something that you cannot see. And I thought, What's he mean? What, what does that mean uh, that you cannot see? And this was the most important lesson in architecture that I ever learned because I began to realize that seeing as an architect was different than seeing as a builder, than seeing as a sculptor, than seeing as a painter, than seeing as a musician, than seeing as a literary critic, than seeing as a poet, etc. Seeing as an architect requires a, another kind of sight. And it is possible to look at any facade of any building and see in it uh, of, of, a, of, a, of a building of quality, a level of abstraction that you couldn't see from the actual physical being of the site. And it was that moment, uh, I didn't realize until 30 or 40 years later, that all of my work depends upon that which cannot be seen. And it's the thing when I take my students to Italy every year, uh, their first lesson is to look at whether it's San Michele or Serlio or Vignola or Bramante or whatever, tell me something which you cannot see. And I never have my students sketch because that's only what they can see, right? Sketching is the worst way to learn to see. I never have my students doing watercolors. I never let them take pictures. Uh, uh, in fact, I threw my camera away on the first trip that I realized the camera wasn't what was important. It was learning how to be there and, and to see. And so what I'd like to see is that, that my work, in, in a funny way, uh, is starting over again. Uh, going back to uh, four square diagrams, going back to diptychs, going back to what cannot be seen as important in the uh, discourse of architecture. And I'm, I'm, I'm really happy about that because I didn't, uh, two years ago, before we started to work on this, um, 
I said, what am I going to do in the last 10 years of my life? You know, be a pain in the neck. Uh, I didn't have a project, right? I didn't have anything I wanted to teach uh, or talk about. I just was doing stuff uh, and sort of living it out. Uh, I got a new idea. Uh, and this is the uh, first time I've given it, I hope, that uh, Miss Dunham Jones will give me a recording so I can study what I said. Uh, I made a few notes. I don't know where, where I put them, they're over there. Uh, but uh, I like it being a first, and I, and I hope uh, you appreciate uh, someone trying to figure out what the hell to do with the next few days of his life. Thank you very much. Um, you, we, Will you take questions? Sure. I, I'm within five minutes of being an hour, so I, I don't like to subject people to anything longer than that. But any questions? Yes? Can you talk about, more about the renaissance of abstraction? Any, sorry, I mean. Um, unless I'm wanting more explanation of what you meant by the renaissance of abstraction. Well, what I mean by the Renaissance, I don't mean Palladio, okay? What I mean is abstraction like, uh, let me see what else, collage. Collage is a dead issue if you go to a painting school today and say, I think I'll work on collage, right? They'll look at you like you're some sort of, you know, feeble character, right? Uh, there are certain things in the firmament of today which are in and out in poetry and literature, in uh, painting and sculpture, etc. There are certain things. One of the outs is abstraction, okay? Uh, and so it interests me to, because I'm working with the Quranic code, supposedly, and I was with, with a conference on uh, abstraction and in uh, Eastern, uh, legal uh, thought, uh, and I have been reading several papers that were given toward this, uh, and I was saying, hey, I'm not really, don't really care about what the Quran says about abstraction. I'm interested, can I revive abstraction as an idea current in architecture here? And that's what I'm saying is that for me, I got an idea that what we meant by abstraction in modernism was just a stylism. It wasn't abstraction at all. And so therefore, what I'm trying to do is to work through philosophically with my student seminars, with the studios, with the work that I'm doing in the office, to see whether uh, there's any, if there are any legs to abstraction. Uh, will this dog hunt? Uh, is really what I'm looking for. I don't know the answer to it, but it gives, it gives me something to stay out of the way of everybody else. I mean, nobody else is working on abstraction, so I figure it's a good thing for me to do. I can stay undercover, you know, <laughs> stay out of the line of fire. I don't have to go in and they're mixing Eisenmann's in the bar. Uh, <laughs> any other thought? Yeah. That's a good, a very good point, because all of my thinking starts from Cardo and Decumanus, the Roman structures. But what you begin to realize, and I've done a lot of analysis from Roman cities through as they spread up through Northern Europe, uh, I've done a lot of diagramming of cities, and at some point, the Cardo and Decumanus breaks down uh, into another kind of radial radiocentric, concentric pattern in medieval cities and is never really brought in again. And so uh, what, what I think one will 
eventually do is go back and study the dissolution of the Cardo Decomanus as an organizing element of urbanity and what replaced it. And I, I certainly, Berlin is a great place to study ur urban organization because Berlin has a medieval core. It has a, a ninth, an 18th century gridiron uh, perimeter block situation where uh, the, the blocks are the important thing and the street is left over. And then you get to the 19th century where the Grand Allées, like uh, Haussmann's in Paris, the, uh, from the Belle Alliance plots in, in, in southern uh, Berlin, uh, the three radial streets uh, that move out, where the street becomes the, the significant element and the buildings added to it. And so what you see in Berlin is characteristic of many European cities going from a medieval core uh, through into uh, a, a, a gridded core, into a 19th century core, and, and, and on. And what I'm trying to find are examples that, of the Cardo Decomanus structure that persists today to find the cities, and I've got to send my students out on another treasure hunt uh, to do that. But that's a very good question. That uh, where did it? I mean, it it re resuscitated itself clearly in American cities, uh, the gridirons. I mean, the whole notion of uh, the, the gridding of America. Uh, was, you know, a very important thing. And you get uh, cities like Charleston and others with uh, Savannah radiating city, I mean, gridiron cities that radiate out. And so what I'm trying to do is locate Europeans' examples, which get, go back further than the American uh, uh, instances. Uh, but I think it's a really, really good question. If you want to help me research, uh, I got a task for you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm serious that it, it would be really interesting to see what overrides it and where does it become uh, a problem. Yes. My name is Li. I'm from Tongji University, China. And I'm guest here. I'm Dean and Professor. Uh, today morning, you had a very exciting short speech about hero star. Yeah. Can you tell our architecture students? What is the difference between hero, star, and normal people? <laughs> well, to me, Archie stars are a media invention, okay? Archie stars uh, are interested in political uh, and economic and social power. Uh, they, they're very uninterested, as far as I'm concerned, with architecture per se. Heroes are architects who, uh, because of the way they treat their discipline, uh, become important to others. They, they uncover, uh, I mean, for me, let's say Frank Lloyd Wright was a model of understanding what architecture in my very first year of, of, of learning at Cornell I ran across Frank Lloyd Wright. I had never heard the word architect before I had gone to Cornell. I run into Paul Rudolph, who is, in my book, a hero. Uh, and Paul is teaching Frank Lloyd Wright, right? And so I, f I find out uh, how to put Frank Lloyd Wright together. It's an interesting little story. And I got a, f what was in Beaux-Arts terms, a first mention in my Frank Lloyd Wright project. Uh, Paul Rudolph goes away. The next project in my class was a yacht club. And I knew from my Frank Lloyd Wright investigations that he had done a project called the Yahara Boat Club. And so I copied the Yahara Boat Club down, did it, found out Mr. Rudolph was coming back. Mr. Rudolph comes back. And I go in and I fail this. I have to go to summer school because of this. I fail. So I said, Mr. Rudolph, what, what's the story? And he said, listen, you can copy once, not twice, okay? <laughs> and uh, heroes are people that you copy from once. Uh, stars maybe twice, okay? And I, 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 I think that's, 
the important difference. Uh, we, we, we are a culture, this room, myself, a culture right now without heroes. Uh, we, we do not, we are not in a heroic age. Uh, and uh, the architectural heroes went out in the 80s somehow um, to replace by all kinds of things, environmental conditions, whatever. Uh, uh, bottom-up uh, crowdsourcing, any number of things, but heroes were not thought to be necessary. And yet, there's no way that I can teach my students from nothing. I mean, I can't say, go draw. I have to say, go draw Palladio, go draw Bramante, uh, go look at uh, Serlio, I mean, whatever. Go look at Corbu. When we first started teaching in the 1960s, Okay, every student had an oeuvre complete on his or her, no, oh no, no hers, his desk, okay? <laughs> there were, no, there were, not, I didn't see any <laughs> women in those days. Uh, but, uh, and you could talk a common language. Now, I heard the same common language when I, and this jury I was talking about at Yale, all the young people could talk uh, whatever they were taught. I, I under, understood nothing. Uh, but um, I didn't know what the models were for these uh, three screen presentations. Uh, I, I, I really couldn't tell. And I couldn't tell how you would translate that to a drawing for a contractor, uh, that someone would build something. And so uh, I find it a very discouraging uh, or both optimistic and discouraging because I think we're on the verge of a hundred years from a new something. Uh, 1914 uh, was a breakthrough. This is 2015. We should be close uh, to something. Uh, I don't know what it's going to be, and I, uh, I, I, it's, but I think for many of us who teach, for many of you who are students, uh, there are no models of discourse. In other words, when uh, a person is lear learning composition in an a comp lit uh, studio uh, major, they read writing. They spend a lot of time reading writing, not writing. And the problem with architecture schools is everybody wants to write. They don't want to read writing, let's say. And so, uh, we are uh, infiltrated by people who know nothing about the history of their discipline, the history of their discourse, which is not something you can say about writers and painters. I mean, when we had David Sally come in, when you hear David Sally talk about painting and talking about Titian and Botticelli and Vermeer and, and the, the, these, these different influences, you say to yourself, holy jeepers, this guy knows his subject. I can't tell you if there are many people in any school that can draw the plans of Le Corbusier by heart uh, like Michael Graves could. He was an amazing teacher. He was a hero. Uh, we disagreed a lot about things, but he knew Corbu back and forth. Uh, there's, the discipline of architecture seems to have disappeared. I, I would bet you. There are very stu few students that can draw a plan of, uh, let's say, La Tourette. That's that's for one. Um, they they just and they don't see the reason to do that. And so, um, for me, uh, it's really important to to bring back or bring into focus what it is that we are trying to teach, et cetera. And so heroes become uh, really important. And we may, I may not like Bob Venturi's work. I may disagree violently with Bob Venturi, but he's certainly a heroic figure. Uh, there's no question about it. Uh, and what he did, he started a whole th way of thinking, rethinking architecture in 1966 in complexity and contradiction. Uh, start with Bob Venturi. You don't have to start with Le Corbusier. 
any number of people, but uh, you got to grab onto something to find out where you are. And you're not at this lecture just because you got nothing else to do on a Friday night. And it seems to me it's my responsibility to stimulate the, the Energizer Bunny in all of you to start moving and, and, and not doing better work, but understand better what your work is supposed to be and how it has been and how it must be in today's, with today's technologies, et cetera. Uh, and I think that, th that's all we can do. I, I don't have a way of telling, I have no idea what you should do. Uh, uh, I don't. But I do know that I can only teach what I know. Uh, and that is, uh, I'm, I mean, one of, part of my work is not just teaching and practicing, obviously, but writing. And I have my Palladio book that I've worked on for 35 years is coming out in September. Next time I come here in 10 years, we'll go over my Palladio book. Uh, it's an interesting book. It's full of 300 drawings that uh, we made um, because I think it's an important uh, to today. Uh, why is it Palladio as opposed to someone else? That's another question. Uh, we're working on a book on Alberti. Alberti was the first architect to ever mention the word space. And if there's anything we do is to deal with space and time, obviously. But there's no book before Alberti that deals with space. Uh, not even Vitruvius. You'll never find the word in uh, Vitruvius. So uh, there are a lot of things that are uh, important. Uh, we, life is a long haul. You all, I think most of you added up or, you know, um, uh, almost as old as I am put together. Uh, and so you've got, what the hell are you going to do with your time? I mean, you can't watch Hawks games every night, you know, and what a bore, uh, honestly. Uh, you, you can't go out and eat ribs and drink beer, you know. You got to do something else. So um, I, f I figure there are uh, lots of possibilities out there uh, for young people because architecture is a dumb business. Let's start out with that. I have four children, wouldn't let any of them near architecture. I'd, <laughs> Uh, it, but it's a very satisfying way of life. And how that becomes satisfying means that it's disconnected from, bu from business in a certain way. Uh, and that's a really interesting possibility to do. Uh, for me, uh, I stay relatively young by, by teaching and confronting people like yourselves and you confronting me. Uh, so I think this gentleman's question, what's the difference between a hero and a star? I think it's really important. Um, I don't know if there are any heroes in, in China. There are some heroes in Japan, uh, but I don't know if there are any heroes over there. Uh, I, I don't know any, but uh, you know, what, what can I say? Anyway, one more question. Uh, I went on too long. I, I think architecture, look, architecture's a bad business. I, I, I didn't say you shouldn't be in business or try, but it's, it's, it, I think it's a dumb way to make money. I, I can think of a lot of really interesting uh, ways to make more money. Let's put it that way. That's what I meant. It's a dumb business. No, I'm not sure we didn't. I'm, I'm not it's sure. Not point at all, at least to the most of, of architects. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if that's true. Yeah. Most people think that they're going to, look, why do my students say, why do we have to study Palladio, right? <laughs> that's not going to help me get a job, okay? A Number one. Yeah. Number two, 
uh, they say, we want to know Revit. We want to know BIM. Now, I don't believe those things ought to be taught at, at, at a university. Those are trade school uh, things. In an office, et cetera, you can learn Revit, but you shouldn't necessarily. But they say, oh, no, we need it to get a job. So contrary to what you and I might hope these people are thinking, they are thinking how the hell do they get into the system and make money so they can do what they think is architecture, OK? Yeah. Which is ultimate uh, way of art. Right. In many ways. Right. From imaginative point and many other elements. So therefore, as the history told us and taught us and showed us that the uh, good uh, art or, or artist or architect had to be very, very practical to be able to succeed other than having ideas they have an uh, architect uh, as, as an artist, or vice versa, whatever comes first, had to succeed in society. You can't be practical without having an idea of what practical is. It's not, I mean, in other words, I believe the idea of practical comes first. You have to have an idea, what, what means practical? I, I'm trying to apply the word practical into artistic. Yeah, I understand. Or, or artistry yeah. architecture. What I'm saying is, um, I, I believe in, if you say, I, I, I'm interested in realism, let's say, or practical building, right, techniques, um, then you have to have an idea, what do you mean by that? And I think that is not so clear what someone, if a student says to me, uh, I mean, we have at Yale a building project, the, the first year students all have to suffer through, as far as I'm concerned, building a dumb house, uh, sorry, Bob, uh, as part of their first year curriculum, okay? And they actually build a damn thing. Now, um, do you need to know how to do architecture to drive a nail into a board? You see, I don't think so, uh, because wait, I'm, I'm a bad nailer. Right? I've always been, that's why I'm an architect, because uh, my, my, my grandfather was a builder, right? And he wanted me to be a builder. And I couldn't, you know, I couldn't do model airplanes. You know, I couldn't do things with my hands. So what I'm saying is that many people choose to become architects because they are not uh, artisan, okay? And so if you're interested in how things go together, uh, let's say, um, I think you have to have an idea why do things go together in the way they do. And I think that's, to me, equally as important. On that note, yeah. uh, I am going to invite everyone upstairs. We have a reception and a, an exhibition that is open uh, that is features the, the, a lot of Georgia Tech architects' contributions to Peachtree Street um, throughout time, and so we've got a reception. We'll continue the conversations no. and, uh, and enjoy. enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.